World Wars, and the Demise of the British Empire. The program taped at Mr. Buchanan's home is an hour. Pat Buchanan, how would you describe Winston Churchill? Winston Churchill was a great man, one of the greatest of the century, uh, a man of extraordinary accomplishments and extraordinary capacities and abilities, but of an incurably flawed judgment. And I think Winston Churchill, for all his triumphs and successes, was probably the man most responsible for the early and rapid collapse of the British Empire. I think some of his judgments were colossally wrong, some of them were right, and I do believe he's probably the one of the most e extraordinary men who ever lived. Expand on why you think he is responsible for the collapse of the British Empire. I think what brought the British Empire down as rapidly as it did and <clears throat> as terribly as it did was World War II. In my judgment, World War II was exactly what Churchill called it, the unnecessary war. And the fatal blunder, as I describe it in my book, was the decision in panic of the British government after Czechoslovakia fell apart in 1939, March, to give an unsolicited war guarantee to a collection of Polish colonels who had a romantic view of their own warlike capacities, who had participated in the breakup of Czechoslovakia. And Britain gave this war guarantee unsolicited to back the Poles in a cause, control of Danzig, where they thought the Germans were fundamentally right. And that war guarantee, which stiffened the Polish spine, gave the Poles the backbone to stand up to Hitler, who now had no way out but to take Danzig. Hitler attacked Poland. The British declared war on Germany. That six-year war brought down the British Empire. And the man who was driving hardest for war with Germany was Winston Churchill. How would you describe Adolf Hitler? Hitler is, a, uh, is clearly a satanic figure uh, in, in terms of what he did, and an evil man, an amoral man, uh, a Darwinian, uh, who called himself a barbarian. But Hitler, as a statesman, his objectives and, 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 and foreign policy and geostrategic policy was in some ways more conservative, less ambitious than that of the Kaiser. Hitler had been in World War II, excuse me, World War I. He had fought for four years, and he had come out of that war with these lessons learned. One was, we made a fatal mistake going to a true front war with Russia and the Atlantic powers. The Americans and the British, as soon as we went to war with them, because they're great sea powers, they cut off all our colonies. Our colonies were hostages. We lost them all instantly. We can't defeat the British and the Americans. Secondly, the British are our natural ally. Even in Mein Kampf, he says, the British, they're a commercial power and a world power with all their colonies. We have no quarrel with the British. And therefore, they and the Italians are our natural allies. And to keep him, the British, friendly or neutral or allied meant that Hitler had to give up any ambitions to take back Alsace-Lorraine or the small territories he had lost to Belgium or Denmark. He wrote those off, and he wrote off the South Tyrol to Italy because he wanted an ally in Italy. What he wanted was peace or indifference in the West and to create around himself a number of basically satellite allied nations that would make Germany the dominant power in Central and Eastern Europe. And if there was one nation he wanted to go after and destroy, it was the Bolshevik regime in the Soviet Union. And in fact, in your book, you quote Mein Kampf saying that he wanted to go east and not He west. wanted to go east, and he made this decision. Other historians of Kirchhoff says the same thing, who wrote the last two very good books on Hitler and his ambitions, was that, that Hitler's ambitions uh, were in the east and maybe only, some believe, only in the east. My view is I'm not even sure Hitler wanted a war with the Soviet Union. Clearly, as I demonstrate in the book from Hitler's own statesman, statements, he wanted the Polish Danzig question in the corridor settled not by force, he told his generals and diplomats. And that's understandable given what he demanded. What did he demand? A Nazi flag over a German flag over Danzig, a city of a town of 350,000, 
political control for the Germans, let the Poles keep economic control. He didn't demand the Polish corridor back, and if he wanted war with Poland, that's what he would have demanded. He demanded a, a quarter mile rail and road corridor across the Polish corridor between Prussia and Germany, which had been separated foolishly at Versailles by giving Poland this strip of German land between them. He never wanted war with Britain, and he never wanted a world war. But September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. He invaded Poland because... Militarily. Militarily, because why did he invade Poland? On the 26th of March, he said, I don't want this issue settled by force with Poland. Why? He wanted Poland as an ally. He had an agreement with Pilsudski, who died in 1935. He liked Pilsudski. These people were right-wing neo-fascists. And, and Hitler liked the regime. And what he wanted from the regime, he thought the regime was a natural ally, just like Mussolini, just like Admiral Horthy, just like General Franco, just like the, uh, the, uh, the Monsignor Tiso in Slovakia. These were right-wingers he thought are natural allies. And in return for giving him Danzig back and a rail and road corridor, he wanted them in the anti-common turn pack that he was pulling together of Germany, Italy, Japan against Moscow, the Soviet Union, Judeo-Bolshevism, as he called it. And so that's what he wanted. But when the Brits gave the war guarantee on the 31st, Hitler went berserk. In two days, he ordered Case White, and that is preparations for an invasion of Poland as of September 1. Uh, at the latest. But then he kept making offers to Poland. He still wanted to deal with the Poles. He didn't want war. And then the British, of course, and the French are in Moscow trying to cut a deal with Stalin. And so Hitler's watching this. So, and the Poles refuse even to talk to him about Danzig. And Henderson, the British ambassador, says, why wasn't I told of the generosity of Hitler's offer of April 25th? So Hitler is increasingly frustrated. He's going to be forced to back down. So he says, the West is, the West, the Poles have joined the West against me. So he forms an alliance with Stalin. Even that, I think, was not designed necessarily for war. It was designed diplomatically to get the Brits out. And what he did, that was on the 23rd or 24th of August. And so Neville Chamberlain is still prime minister. So Chamberlain, what does he do? When Hitler announces this Hitler-Stalin pact, Hitler thinks that this brilliant pact, we got the Soviets on our side and we're there, and clearly Poland's going to be divided again and the Brits can't do anything about it, they're not going to stand up behind their guarantee. The 24th, Chamberlain reissues the guarantee to Poland and forms a military alliance with Poland. What did Hitler do? He backed down. He called off the invasion for the 25th. And he tried to find a way all during that week, that period, to give, get some kind of deal with the Poles, which would at least, or some kind of offer to the Poles, which would convince the British to say, look, Poland, you've got to deal with Germany or we're not going to stand by the guarantee. So ultimately, when you see Hitler in his own interpreter, when the British uh, hand the ultimatum in and Henderson takes it into Ribbentrop, who takes it into Hitler, Hitler is, uh, is, they just say his face was a mask of rage. He looked at Ribbentrop and he said, what now? And what he meant, I think, was our diplomacy has failed because he never, never wanted war with the British Empire. He, of all the leaders, take FDR, Churchill, Stalin, Mussolini, all the others, of all the leaders, Hitler was as a greater admirer of the British Empire than any of them except Winston Churchill. Pat Buchanan, are you suggesting that Poland should have been sacrificed to prevent World War II? No, I'm not suggesting Poland should have been sacrificed. What I am saying is, as of 1930, first, the Polish corridor and Danzig were not worth a war by Great Britain. Secondly, Great Britain could not defend the corridor and Danzig. Third, they had no plans to defend Danzig and the corridor. Fourth, they thought the Germans were right on the issue. What I'm saying is they should never have issued the war guarantee to Poland. They should have told the Poles the truth. We can't defend you, and there's no way we can defeat Germany in the amount of time it's going to take them to defeat you. You've got to decide this yourselves. What the British should have done and the French after the collapse of Czechoslovakia is exactly what I wrote in a book, Republic, Not an Empire, and George Kennan agreed with me. And what it is is draw a line across the Low Countries 
and across the front of France, a red line, and tell Hitler if he crosses it, he's at war with Great Britain and France. Hitler would never have crossed the line. That is what the Americans did. When Stalin had control of all of Eastern Europe, we didn't say you've got to get out of Poland or if you move into Hungary as they did in 56, you're at war. We said if you cross the Elbe River, you're at war with NATO and the United States and Stalin didn't cross it. That is what I'm saying, that Hitler didn't want war with Poland, he didn't want war with Britain, and had there been no guarantee, no war guarantee, there would have been no war in the West in my judgment. And frankly, all the people, all the Jewish people and Christian people of Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, Holland, France, Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece, would have survived the war. There would have been no war in the West. That's what I believe. When did Winston Churchill become prime minister? He became prime minister in the uh, 10th of May, 1940. Uh, and he became prime minister as a result of the Norvik debacle, the Norway debacle, where the first Lord of the Admiralty, who happened to be Winston Churchill, plotted a British move into neutral Norway to violate their nor neutrality to seize the Norwegian ports, which were being used by the Germans, who were transshipping iron ore from Sweden th through Norway and down the coast because the Swedish ports were frozen in the winter. Churchill had this plan to violate the neutrality of Norway, but he foolishly leaked it to some military aides and it got word got to Hitler. Hitler wanted to keep Norway neutral. It was just what he wanted because he had a great benefit, Norway and Denmark. So Hitler said, in effect, the British are going to move in there and we've got to move first. And so Admiral Raider and his troops, some of whom were planted in the uh, holds of merchant ships, they were all moved into Norway and they took it a day before the British Marines arrived. And they took all the ports. And this debacle, Lord Lloyd George called it one of a series of debacles, which was Churchill's responsibility, caused the collapse of Chamberlain's government. And who rose to power? <laughs> Winston Churchill, the architect of the disaster. Uh, it is an amazing story. I mean, the man did have great luck. It, it, but weren't the British invited by the King of Norway? No, the British were planning an invasion. of new Norway was neutral. The British were planning to move into it directly and violate its neutrality. This is what is so funny about, not funny, but it's so uh, paradoxical about World War I. You know, Churchill persuaded Lloyd George, or helped persuade him. I think Lloyd George was going to stay with the war party anyhow because he was an opportunist and he knew if he went against it, he'd be out. But Churchill persuaded Lloyd George, said, stay with us until, uh, we, until we find out how the Germans come through into France in World War I. This is April, I mean, August 19, uh, guns of August 19, uh, 1914. Because Churchill knew that the, the German army had to come through Belgium. And so, and that Churchill and the others, a horrible thing they've done, violated the neutrality of Belgium. Churchill was planning to violate the neutrality of Belgium himself by blockading Belgian ports if the Germans hadn't violated it first. Well, in your new book, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War, How Britain Lost Its Empire and the West Lost the World,